Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Stephen Trainer, and I'll be uh, taking you through the webinar this morning. Um, this today's topic is advanced solar eclipse planning, and I'll explain a little bit about what, what that means. Um, the goal of this is really to um, help you all get ahead in your thinking and familiarity with what's going to happen during the solar eclipse and in particular the upcoming one on the 8th of april in 2024 and that um i think to get most out of photographing these events uh what's super important is sort of the situational awareness if you will around what is going to happen when uh what to expect so that you as a photographer have sort of internalized, I think, the timings and the expectations of, of what's going to happen and stand the very best chance of getting all of the shots that, that you would like, like to get. And in to, order to do that, we're going to focus today um, primarily on, on what happens around the very beginning of totality and around the end of totality. So that's what's known as second and third contacts. So I will cover some of the basics, but I'm going to skip through it fairly quickly. Um, if you're new to Eclipse photography, haven't seen one before, um, I will provide some links at the end to other webinars and other tutorials that we have online that, that you can read up on to um, get, cover those basics in, in all the detail that you'll need. So let's jump in. Um, thank you to those of you who submitted some questions in advance. Um, I thought I would just give, uh, give you all a flavor of what's come in so that you get a sense of what we'll talk about. And it breaks down into a few nice themes that I think we can map into the presentation. Um, the first one uh, is an excellent question concerned on, on how to observe the upcoming eclipse safely. So I will talk about that before we jump into any other details. Other questions are, these next two are really around location. What's going to happen at my location or places I'm considering going to? So we'll go into that in, in some detail. Um, some questions on exposure, um, one particular one on auto exposure adjustment and capture for Sony, that I, I have no experience with myself, so it's going to be difficult to, to speak to, but I will talk about um, how to think about managing your exposures during, uh, during the eclipse. Um, and in particular, I think that the second question gets to the heart of the matter, which is around bracketing in totality and what you're going to get with different different settings. I'll show you some illustrations of that as, as well. Um, time frame for the eclipse, how long from the start to the finish and uh, how to capture it? Uh, that's an excellent question. We'll talk about that. Um, and then the second question here, um, I'm considering taking a series of photos, say five minutes apart during the eclipse. How can I determine where the sun will be at the start and at the end from C1 to C4 so that I can point the camera and choose a proper focal length with confidence. We covered that last time, um, but I will touch on that one I, again, and you should get a good sense of how to work that out uh, from presentation today. Then uh, some questions about, so about solar filters. Um, th those were particularly relevant if any of you photographed last month's um, annual eclipse uh, on the 14th of October last month. That was really an event where you pretty much wanted a filter on your camera for, for the duration, unless you were feeling particularly adventurous, which a few people were, um, but to avoid damage to your camera, your sensor, um, your eyesight, you wanted a filter. So I will recap some of that. It, it's certainly going to be relevant to the partial phases of next April's eclipse. Okay, eye safety. It, it's a simple rule. So how, how can you observe the total eclipse safely? The answer is, do not look at the, the sun directly. It's as simple as that. What you have to then do is say, well, how, what do you need in order to observe it safely? And the answer is some certified um, eclipse uh, glasses. And the key thing to look out for is this ISA standard 12312-2. If the equipment comes from a reputable supplier and sports this claim that it meets the standard, it's, it's probably going to be perfectly good. Check it for scratches, damages with something that you've had in your bag since, say, 2017. Um, things that don't work, sunglasses, ND filters, stacking filters or sunglasses, and don't do that. Uh, never look through the camera um, through an optical viewfinder. 
uh, at the unobstructed sun. Um, so for the partial phases of the eclipse, do you need a solar filter? The answer is yes. For totality, a simple way to think of it is that you're, once the sun is fully obscured by the moon, you're no longer looking at the sun, therefore there's no danger to your, your eyesight. So during totality, you won't be able to see very much if you keep your eclipse glasses on, and um, you won't be able to photograph virtually anything if you keep the solar filter on, on the camera. So during totality, so that is from C2 to C3, and we'll go through what exactly that means shortly, um, filters off, eclipse glasses off, otherwise on. Um, there is a margin of a few seconds where you have to decide the timing of, of the removal of this equipment. And we'll talk about that uh, in more detail. So this was last month's eclipse. Uh, this was the annular eclipse. And an annular eclipse, just a quick recap, is when the, the, the moon is farther away from Earth. Therefore, it doesn't appear large enough to fully cover the sun. And so this almost perfect ring that you see here this is taken through a solar filter, a white light solar filter, which is why the sun appears white, which is pretty much its true color. And uh, it, it forms the ring because the moon is lying perfectly within it. We were on the central line of this eclipse. Um, that was the annular. It's very different from what we're going to get next, next April. And today we're going to mostly focus on, on what's coming up. So you may have seen this photo before, but we're going to talk about slightly different angle on this today. Uh, this was a shot from the 2017's total eclipse, um, taken around the time of maximum eclipse, and it's showing the corona. So that's the, the, the highly extended outer atmosphere of, of, of the, the sun. It extends for a gazillion miles um, into, into space. And this exposure was, I think, this was uh, uh, 7,300 mil lens at 300 millimeters. F8, which is good middle of the range, sharp aperture. Um, the ISO was 100, so minimal noise. You could probably go 200, 400 or more on modern cameras with where the noise performance is very low. And the exposure time, the shutter speed was a sixth of a second. And in general, what's gonna happen during totality is that the, the longer your shutter speed, the more corona you will pick up and the less detail around the edge you will, you will pick up as you go longer. So here is a, another shot. I can skip back to that diamond ring. This, this is from the same bracketed series of shots. So if you're familiar with bracketing, or if you're not familiar with bracketing, or what it is on some cameras, you can do it in an automated way, but you can also do it manually. And bracketing simply means choose a middle exposure and then take a shot one stop down one stop up or two stops down two stops up or take a whole sequence and i was I, i'd forgotten I'd, i was actually doing seven stop bracketing se bracketed sequences for this eclipse so this shot was the minus three stops and the other shot where you see this one here the corona that was plus three stops so that's a range of six stops between what you see there and what you see there so you'll notice here that we're seeing far less of the corona. It looks smaller. It's just, it's not smaller. It's just the camera's not picking it up because it isn't bright enough to register on sensor. But what we now do see uh, are these fainter features, the, the pink chromosphere and these little pink flares or prominences. These are solar prominences and they appear during the eclipse. The, the more continuous band of pink is what's called the chromosphere. And that is, it's around two and a half thousand miles thick. It's, a, it's sort of the layer just above the photosphere. The photosphere is what will blind us if we look at it directly. That's the bright light producing part of the sun. The chromosphere um, surrounds that. The sun is what? Uh, 696,000 kilometers, I think, across, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me if I remember correctly. Um, and then the chromosphere is uh, two and a half thousand or, or, or thereabouts. It's a little bit unknown exactly what the thickness is, funnily enough. So exposure is what's going to um, control whether you get a shot that looks like this or like this. This shot, 
this is a, yes it's a function of exposure but it's also a function of timing so this is after uh, third contact so that is just as the moon is moving away and starting to expose the photosphere of the sun once again and there's a chunk of photosphere in here which based on the exposure of the camera appears in this somewhat flared out um, gives this flared out appearance this is a single shot it's single exposure it's not a combination of shots you can still see corona you can still see the prominences there and there you can still see chromosphere but you also get this bright diamond ring effect so that's a question of timing of the shot as well as exposure uh now this shot this is this is going to occupy some of our talks today and this one uh this was something that neither Alice or I managed to quite capture in 2017, which was uh, this phenomenon called Bailey's beads. And Bailey's beads um, appear, you can see it, it sort of looks like the diamond ring, but there's multiple diamond rings. It's like lots of small jewels. And literally what this is, is the, the, the edge of the moon, or more formally what's called the limb, the lunar limb, which is the edge that is presented to us during the eclipse. Uh, is not smooth. It's it's rough. It's quite considerably rough with with valleys and mountains and and so forth. And what you're seeing here is that um, at certain points the photosphere shines through the valleys of the moon, and it gives very distinctive and unique patterns based on your location, the circumstances of the eclipse, how the moon is oriented at that time and place um, in. Uh, at, at these moments during the eclipse and that determines the pattern of the beads that you see so this is um near uh c2 uh, second contact so this is short seconds after this would have been taken we would have been into totality that there would be no bright beads shining there so this is this is just to explain a little bit more about this lunar limb phenomenon and some of the things it gives rise to uh the reason it varies um, from one eclipse to the next and from one location in the eclipse path to the next is to do with a, th a phenomenon called libration. <clears throat> and the easiest way to think of that is that the moon, we're all familiar with the phases of the moon and how it's, it grows from new moon to full moon and, and back again. But during the course of that, you may have seen or noticed or read that uh, the actual features on the face of the moon that we see during during each cycle vary and that's because the moon is moving that way that uh, that way and that way so there are sort of three axes of of libration it's like a wobble in 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 the in the orbit and once you've worked out at the point of time of the eclipse where it's going to be in that orientation then you can determine what is the limb profile going to be once you know what the limb profile is going to be, you can work out what type of Bailey's beads are going to be possible. And so I'll show you how we can do that um, and get out ahead of that question for next April's eclipse um, using photo ephemeris today. So here's the quick recap on the contact. C1, start of partial. C4, end of partial. C2, start of totality. C3, end of totality. And in the middle, maximum eclipse. You, you might think, ah, so the corona gets bigger at maximum eclipse. It's not. It's just that these are different exposures. So the corona is what it is. It becomes visible at the start between C2 and C3, start of totality and end of totality. And then you determine how much of it you want in your shots based on um, your exposure bracketing. This is just a recap on the annular eclipse. I think it's pretty much the same thing, except the moon never fully covers the sun, otherwise identical. What we'll do now, we're going to jump over into uh, photo ephemeris web. Now, most of uh, most, but not all of everything I'll show you today um, is is also available or will soon be available in in the iOS app. Uh, certainly, the Eclipse paths and uh, the simulator that I'll show you are, are both there. Um, there's a few more things I've got to catch up on adding to that. Um, some of which are the the very latest. Eclipse features, which we've added into this version 3.9 of the web app uh, this this week. We're going to start by looking at the 2024 eclipse, and I'll show you 
first new feature um, to be aware of. If you click into the events tab now, so I'll, just, I'll show you where that was again. So I'm on the, the homepage of the web app, app.photoephemeris.com. The homepage is where we view the map. And at the top, we have the date, date controls here. And this little events list, I can click. And there is now, that's what you would have seen previously, which is the list of events for the current year. There are now controls just to advance year to year. But there's also a whole new tab dedicated to solar eclipses. And you may have spotted that we have uh, every eclipse between 1600 and 2500, which may be uh, too much information. But if you get into this stuff and you want to research historical eclipses or look for particular eclipse circumstances, you'll find it all here. Let's focus initially on the 2024 eclipse. Uh, Monday, April the 8th, you've got a few different icons that basically correspond to the different type of eclipse. So this is a total solar eclipse, type T. These T, H, and A abbreviations and a few other variants on them. Um, this data comes initially from NASA's five millennium catalog of solar eclipses. So it's 5,000 years worth of, of data. And I've extracted um, nine centuries from it to, to begin. Uh, you can click through and look at the original data with this link at the, at the bottom left here. So T for total eclipse. Uh, I'll come back to gamma in a moment. This next number, there are tooltips on all of these. So you can, you can, uh, you can hover over them and there you see it says magnitude. So the magnitude of an eclipse is essentially the fraction of the sun's diameter that is obstructed by the moon. So to get a, a total eclipse, you need a magnitude of one or greater. And I think the highest possible magnitude is something like 1.12, 1.14, something like that. Um, this is 1.05. And that means that at this location, or this approximate location of 25 degrees north, 104 degrees west, at around 20 past noon, lies somewhere in Mexico, you're going to see an eclipse of with a totality of four and a half minutes. So you can skip through this list and see what's coming up, see what's been reviewed. If you have photos from 2017, you can skip back to there and have a look. Um, but let's focus on 2024. Let me quickly tell you about the gamma number. Gamma is in, well, there's a tooltip. It is the distance of the, it's a bit technical. It's the distance of the shadow cone axis from the center of Earth, units of equatorial radii at the instance of instant of greatest eclipse. So you go, my goodness, what does all that mean? And it's a fair question, but there's a simple way to think about it. It basically means if you say the shadow of the moon, um, where is it going to lie with respect to the equator? So if, if the gamma is zero, greatest eclipse lands on the equator. If gamma is one, it lands on the North Pole. If it's minus one, it hits the South Pole. And so you can sort of eyeball that number and go, is this a mid-latitude eclipse or is it a high-latitude eclipse? Um, look at this partial in 2025, it's a gamma of one, which basically means it's farther north than the North Pole, which why that's why it's only a partial, it misses the Earth, you only get the penumbra of the tits. So that's if you're into these, these um, more technical information on eclipses, uh, that's what the gamma, gamma number is. So let's have a look at this, you can do two things, you click to select the eclipse, you can either choose set date, if you choose set date, it's going to set the date of the app to April 8th, 2024, but it's not going to change where the map pin was left or the, the zoom of the map or how it's centered. Um, so if you have, have the pin in a place you want and you just want to load the eclipse for that day, use set date. However, what's generally easier is to click view. I'll click it and then you'll see what happens. When I click view, it zooms out, it puts the red pin on that point of greatest eclipse and it loads the eclipse path map and uh, sets the time to 1218 and that is in the middle of the eclipse and so when you're in this middle of the eclipse the little simulator pops up here let's zoom in and we'll look at a little a few little things here um the the coordinates that they provide in that five millennium catalog are sort of rounded to whole latitudes and longitudes 
So it's a little bit approximate. Um, we're close to the central path. I will drop it right on the central path. And um, this is in Mexico. You can see that's where the eclipse is longest. And if I click then in the timeline, we have first contact, C1, second contact, C2, max eclipse with the, um, the magnitude shown, C3, and way over here, C4. So I click max eclipse. And the uh, time is updated to that. It also updates the time here with, with a bit more precision. And it shows you how long is it from, sorry, second contact is what I wanted. Second contact until C3, about four and a half minutes. And at the start of the eclipse, the magnitude is one. So far, so good. So what we'll do next, I want to show you how to access a new mode for the simulator. So you haven't seen this before. I don't think this is this is new this week. And once you've got this set up, you have an eclipse loaded, the, the pin is in the path, you've selected a time in the range of the eclipse and simulators here, you can now click this expand button. So if I click the expand button, you now are taken to a new view within the app. The, the, the map and the simulator basically swap places. So the map's still here. I can still adjust the map pin um, and you can see you see how that's changing with the simulation as I draw, drop it, it recalculates based on where I go. It's not changing the selected time, but it's changing the location. You can get back to the map just by re-expanding it here or by clicking map up there. But now with this new full screen simulator, you can really zoom in on, on a few more, few more details. And you'll find, let me explain how I'm doing the zooming. I have a trackpad. Um, if I put uh, two fingers on the trackpad and drag down, that's what I'm doing there, it's zooming in. So that's two fingers on the trackpad. If you're on a mouse, it's probably the middle button with a scroll wheel, um, if you have that. Um, or if you're on a touch screen, I think you can pinch, just like you would zooming in on a photo on a smartphone, um, pinch to zoom in and out. So you can zoom out to that degree, or you can zoom in let me just move it to the left there and so we don't lose everything and we'll zoom right in and you can see also now look at that that's the the lunar limb so that's the actual profile for what's going to happen on april 8th at this location of the red pin um but you have to zoom in quite a lot to to see it because it's it's we're a long way from the moon to pan left and right, as I'm doing here, I click down on the trackpad, hold my thumb down, and then move one finger to drag left and right. If you're on a mouse, it's a left click and move the mouse around, and that will pan uh, the simulator. So zoom and pan, first two things to know. The controls for this mode of the simulator are, it's the same set of data and the same set of controls, but they're displayed a little bit differently. There's a couple of additions as well. Talk about first of all, uh, down here on the chart, you can uh, move as you wish through the um, through the progress of the eclipse like that. And the chart is showing you the magnitude of the eclipse over time. So as we go, uh, let's have a look here, back to there and start at the beginning of partial. So this is one way to find out what's the duration of this event. You can you can also do it from the timeline on the map page. You just read the times. Um, but from 10.58 in the morning to 1.39 in the afternoon is fourth contact. So what's that? Around four hours and 41 minutes, three hours and 41 minutes. Yeah. Um, that's one way to do it. You can also uh, click... You see these little contact times here. C1 will take you straight to C1. Max will take you straight to max. C3 will take you to third contact. The little diamond before and after C before C2 and after C3 takes you to five seconds after the contact time, which is when the typically the diamond ring is is appearing. So that's a quick way to sort of get what's where is the diamond ring going to appear around the, the limb of the moon and uh 
then C4 over there. So those are the contact time controls. Let's say we want to start five seconds before C2. The next thing you can do is you can click the play button here and you can play back the, the, the eclipse in a simulation of the eclipse in, in real time if you have it at times one or at five times real speed or a hundred times real speed. So if you're somewhere in the middle of the, the partial phase, a hundred times is sort of real time gets a little bit boring because um, it's several hours, but you can see sort of how that moves. Like that once you get close to totality you probably want to switch this down to times five or times one let's just do for times one and just watch what happens so i click play and you see the time is updating here the magnitude is updating the obscuration the air percentage area of the sun's obscured increases and then it shows you how long is left until c3 this gives you then a sense of okay how long do I have? So when you're thinking about photographing these events, you sort of want to be mapping out the time in your head as to as to what you what you want to capture when. And I think the key takeaway from today's uh, talk is is knowing just how an intense how intense a, a, a moment C two and C three are in terms of the photographic possibilities and how many exposures you're going to want to grab to make sure you, you don't miss anything. Um, Alice and I, we saw the 2017 total eclipse. We photographed the uh, annular eclipse. Back in 2017, I must have been asleep at the wheel because I didn't capture anything around C2 or C3. I don't know why. I just, for some reason, didn't, didn't, didn't press my shutter, and I wish I had. Alice did, so she got that really nice um, uh, diamond ring shot and there's another shot which has a little hint of Bailey's beads the exposure wasn't quite perfect for it um, but you need to be on the ball if you're going to capture some of these phenomena so part of this is um, I would encourage you all to to explore your locations for next April um, drop into the simulator and and just get that build that intuitive sense of timing how quickly things move how, how quickly the appearance of this thing evolves uh, so that you've internalized some of that and it's not going to be a surprise on, on the day. Oh, one, one more thing on timing. These little buttons here, these will skip back 10 seconds at a time or forward 10 seconds at a time. So there's, there's, there's plenty of ways to control the time now. It's, it's quite easy just to get, get set up. There's also, if you just want a tour of this thing, you can click Start Tour and it'll give you sort of the abbreviated version of the instructions on how to use this. So we talked about the mini map. Uh, uh, we've talked about the playback controls here. We've talked about the contact controls. We've talked about the chart and the time slider. Oops, need to fix that missing string. Then next, I'm going to talk to you about this new mode for the simulator called outline mode. And that's going to help us look at this lunar limb effect and in particular Bailey's beads and the chromosphere in, in rather more detail. And then this Bailey's beads exposure slider will come to that once I've shown you the outline mode. And then there's a whole bunch of tutorials down here as well and, and things you can look at. So if you click help, once you're in this full eclipse simulator page, three articles for you to read, so solar eclipse planning, advanced solar eclipse planning, which is mostly what we're talking about today, and then the technical note on some of this eclipse functionality. But let's talk about this outline mode. So this button here toggles between what I call photorealistic mode and outline mode. And I'll tell you why, why we bothered to build this. Um, you saw when I zoomed right in before uh, that you could just make out the, the roughness in, in the, the, the moon's surface. Well, it is hard to see. So this outline gives you in orange an exaggerated vertical profile of the, uh, of the moon's edge versus blue, which is just the reference smooth sphere model. And there are a few things you can do with this. One, one is you, you can see that there are areas that are relatively smooth, not completely smooth, and there are areas that are much rougher, much more uneven here, uh, here, and particularly here on the southern, when I say south, I mean still like 6 p.m. of the clock, 
um, uh, edge, a limb of, of, of the moon. And intuitively, you might think, well, okay, if, if I'm looking to, I'd like to see Bailey's beads and photograph those, you'd like the contact to be occurring in one of these rougher parts of the, the, lun the lunar limb. And that's exactly the way it works. So one thing that you can use this this orange line for is a visual cue to say, well, if if the contact is um, up here, which it is on this location, it's C2 and C3 over here, intuitively, where might have more beading? And intuitively, I would say, I haven't planned this location. I just dropped the pin there. Um, so I, I will find out if, find out if I'm right or not. But you go, that looks a little bit rougher. There's there's some a couple of significant valleys there, a little bit of lower terrain here. So what there might be more beading is going to happen around C3 than at C2 because the, the profile is rougher. So the simulator can show you this. So let me show you how that works. I'm just going to play forward from this point. I'm going to zoom right in so you can see it. There's, you can see already, in fact, that uh, there's a little bit of white exposed there. And if I just play it forward, there it is coming out. So you can see this, these broken stretches. It was pretty short. There wasn't much going on. Let's go back and watch that. We'll get back 10 seconds and we'll watch again. Here we go. But there it comes out. So over a space of about 10 seconds, you're getting little broken stretches of photosphere. However, it's still a little bit hard to see. I think you'd probably agree. Um, if you increase the exposure, you'll see that it starts to look, it gives that flared out appearance. And that's actually typically how cameras will capture it. It depends on your exposure settings, but that's sort of how it looks in many photographs. So let's go back to 10 seconds and play it again with, with that. I'm going to crank the resolution up. And there you go. You can sort of get this sense of where the beads are appearing. So the yellow arc, that is simply calculating, I'll pause it for a moment. The yellow arc says, that's the area where you should be looking for Bailey's beads in general. Um, and then the white beads are, the, are actually mathematically what's predicted to happen. So you go, wow, okay, so how's that possible to, to, to know that? Can we be certain this, this actually works? I'll show you that in a moment. Let's quickly just go back to C2 and play that one through. There it's disappearing. So yeah, a little bit of beading, but it comes and goes over, what, six seconds? So you really want to be concentrating your bursts of um, shots uh, around these times of, of C2 and C3. And also, if you know where you're going to be, you can work out are the beads coming before the predicted time of C2 or after. It's going to depend on where you are on the limb. If C2 lands at one of these areas where the, the limb is higher than the blue circle, then C2, you'll still you'll get beads um, it, that, that will delay it if, oh, let me get that right, is that right? Yes, it'll come, it'll be covered earlier. That's right, so C2 will be earlier than advertised. If it's one of these areas here, it's gonna be later than advertised, if that makes sense. Let me show you um, this photograph. So this photograph is from last month's annular eclipse. And this is with a solar filter on, on the lens. And you can see this pattern of beading. This is just at third contact. And there's break there, break there, tiny break there, and, and so forth. And there's a page you can get on the site where I, I show a whole bunch of comparisons between actual eclipse photographs and what the simulator shows. And you can see some pretty good agreement with what, what happened. So there's a whole bunch of these examples here that you're welcome to, to explore. It also gives you sort of a range of flavors of the typical appearances of, of the beads during um, eclipses or, or, or videos, um, different exposures. This one's from um, April of this year, the hybrid solar eclipse um, of April this year. And again, you see that's, that's showing a, a lot more glare and flariness than I have in the simulator, but the overall pattern is, is pretty good match. Then 
let me skip back down to this one. So this was the that was the photograph I showed you in the slideshow earlier of Bailey's beads, and this is the equivalent link in the, the simulator. If I uh, quick recap, so it's August twenty seventeen. We'll view that. Uh, the location was uh, Madras, Oregon. And we'll go back into the simulator and we'll go five seconds before C2. And there it is. Right there. So that's um, that's the match to, where was the photograph? Yeah, there we go. So you can predict the timing and the placement and the exact appearance of these beads using using this, this simulator. And one thing that's uh, interesting to do is to explore different locations and what they're going to give you. So if you have some discretion about where you're going to go and you, you're interested in capturing some of these other phenomena, you can check out what happens if I go further close to the, to the edge here and again just go to five seconds before C2. You see how the contact positions moved significantly and we're into this other rougher part of the, of the limb. Let's go back 10 seconds. So you get a very different beading pattern. So you can check it out exactly for any place you might like to go or photograph. The beads are lasting longer here um, because of the rougher profile. They're in a different position around the limb because we're closer to the southern limit of the eclipse. So that's what this tool is intended for. Um, one other trick that you can do, let me go back again here to C2. If you crank up this exposure to maximum, um, once you're at maximum exposure, it's like a virtual setting. Uh, it gives you sort of a relative appearance of, um, of the simulator that typically matches to the sorts of exposures you're going to see um, in, in camera uh, on, on Eclipse Day. It's not meant intended to be an absolute sort of exposure meter. It's more to say, look, if you go to minus 16.6 stops, that's like putting a solar filter on the camera. And at zero, it's like not having a solar filter on the camera. You're probably going to change other exposure parameters as well between having a filter on and not. But this is just to try to capture that in one slider. If you crank it up to zero, i.e. no filter on the camera, then the, the app will now also show the chromosphere, which is the little pink line. We saw that in some of the photographs. And if you're super interested in, in these details, you can find that actually, in addition to Bailey's beads, which are little areas of exposed photosphere, you can get chromosphere beading as well, where the, where the mountains of the moon break through the chromosphere. So you can use that to check for those too. It looks like there's almost one sort of here as it goes, as it goes thin. So that's what that's for. The other two, uh, controls. I'm almost done with 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 these controls. Then we'll talk a little bit more about um, some practicality stuff. <clears throat> the um, this button. Uh, let me find a better example to show you for this. And we go back to the map. We'll look at a quick historical eclipse because I think they're quite cool. There's one. I'm going to go back to an eclipse from 1966. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a similar one to this coming up in 2031, but this, this one here is an annular eclipse, seen the magnitude as 0.999, it's just almost total, and we'll view that one. <clears throat> and uh, if I just grab, um, and we'll go, it's, it's, the path is very thin for this one because it's um, it's so so close between being total and, and and not. But I'll put the pin there. We'll go back into the simulator. We'll go to Max Eclipse. I'll turn that off. This is what it looked like. Um, it's quite quite amazing. So it's, this is what's called the broken ring eclipse. The size of the moon, size of the sun, is so close that the, the the mountains of the moon break break through and cause beading right the way around the arc. And there are some photographs you'll find online in a few places of this eclipse, and they match exactly to what you see in in the simulator um, at different times. So let's just have a look here. Uh, we'll play this one through, and you can watch how quickly this thing evolves. 
it's a short event it's like 20 seconds and it's it's done but within that there's all this visual richness and we can still get that in in eclipses in in the next few years um uh, here not quite as spectacularly as this i suspect but uh similar one thing i wanted to show you was that um in the outline mode here you see the yellow circle is right the way around the limb that's because it's worked out that in fact beading is possible everywhere it could happen um anywhere so it shows the limb the the it, it shows it's flaring um all the way around and in other circumstances uh where that's not the case where so for example um back to back to 2024 well, let's look at let's look at the the and let's look at the annular from from this year there we go we'll view that annular and we'll go to um farmington new mexico there we go and go to c2 so with this one, this is an annular eclipse, and by default, uh, the simulator is just going to show the beading under the yellow arc, but you can toggle this on and then show it everywhere. The only thing to be aware of is that this can be a little bit intensive for the for the graphics processor to, to calculate all of these flare locations. So you can toggle that on and off. If you if you only really you know, zoomed in in this area, for example, then you go, that's fine. If you really want to see what it would look like if you would photograph it without a filter, then there you go. So that's uh, that's that. This then is the final thing. Uh, this is just the resolution of beads. So uh, this is more, mostly a performance thing. Um, if you're on an older computer, you might need to put this down. But if you want the most data, you can crank it up. You can see a little bit of difference in the resolution there as I change the slider. <clears throat> so. That's uh, that is the bead the bead simulator. Let's come out of that. I'm going to check in on some questions now, and we'll we'll see where where we are. Okay, Jay asks, uh, how many hours days out can we reliably nail down our final planning? I think the the I would put it into two 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 buckets of thinking here. Uh, one is that um, you can nail down. The planning of what, assuming clear skies, what would be visible, um, you can do that today for next April. You could do it today for an eclipse in 2045. It doesn't matter. You can do it anytime. There's virtually nothing that's going to change. The only thing that possibly might change is this little delta T number, which could change the precise timing by, I don't know, tenth of a second, half a second maximum. But you can do all of that way in advance. So working out, if I go here, I'll be able to see Bailey's beads at this point of a limb and photograph them for a period of seven, eight seconds. You can know that all in advance. The only things you can't know in advance, I think, are, are the logistics. So what's happening at the location? Is there something that may prevent you reaching your planned spot? And weather. Um, for weather, uh, I mentioned this site before, but the site to go to is called eclipsofile.com. I think I spelled that right. And this is all about eclipse weather. Uh, Jay Anderson, I think, I think used to work for the um, maybe the meteorology meteorology service in Canada, um, but has been doing this for decades um, and produces fantastic reports on likely weather. Also, with advance, so what what to expect um, based on historical patterns. So we're always going to have the lower lower cloud cover. Let's have a look at what he has here for April 8th. And um, there's, a, there's one particular map. I'll see if, it, see if I can find it. This one's pretty cool. This is a sort of transect along the central path, and it shows you the cloud fraction by location. So this is coming up from the Pacific up to the Atlantic. And you can see that here in Mexico, near Torreon, is the lowest historical cloud cover um, for April 8th from the records and as you head further towards the northeast it's up in quebec it's maxing out and uh, gander it's newfoundland i think isn't it um the high probability of clouds so those things you can look at in advance um for the weather forecasts it really does change i don't know if anybody had experience of doing this with the annular eclipse uh, last month but we were going to new mexico the weather forecast the, the clouds were literally 
flipping back and forth for three or four days as to whether there would be cloud cover overhead at our planned spot. And it was only until I would say maybe 20 or so hours before eclipse time that it started settling into saying it's going to be clear. So it can be pretty late in the day. So if you can be flexible, great, um, always, always best. But even then, I think, you know, think about what your alternative locations would be and view them in the simulator, see what's going to be happening there. And so that you're not taken by surprise once, once you get there. Uh, Wes asks, at what point near the diamond ring before C2 does the camera filter get removed? It's an excellent question. Um, let's, uh, let's look at that. The, the answer is uh, soon enough that you don't miss the moment, um, but not so soon that you're going to be shooting intensively and potentially damaging the camera. So to, to capture the diamond ring and the baby's beads, you're going to need to shoot a slightly longer exposure, um, a lot longer than when you had the solar filter on. So there's a few adjustments to make. So first thing is think about a filter you can remove quickly and efficiently. Practice doing that in advance. Uh, and secondly, be aware that you're going to have to flip the um, the, the exposure settings pretty quickly. So I would say, um, I, I, I'm not speaking from experience because I didn't even take a solar filter to 2017. Um, so I, I, I didn't photograph the partial phase at all. I started photographing too late, as you can see when I said I didn't get the um, diamond rings, but Alice photographed in time um, at C3. And it's probably around 20 to 30 seconds, I, I would say, is, is a reasonable guideline for that um to take the fil filter off also practice putting it back on because after c3 you're going to want to get the filter back on if you're photographing a whole a whole sequence um you also ask how much exposure to Bailey's beads is safe for the camera uh the, if it truly is just beads um then you probably have they, they don't last long enough to really damage the camera. The difference would be in an annular eclipse. So in an annular eclipse, the general guidance is keep the filter on the whole time. And that's what we did last month. However, some people photographed it without a filter, but that's where you have to be really careful because the amount of exposed photosphere, you can see it. I'll put the, um, do that. All of this is potentially damaging, damaging your, your sensor if you're photographing it for a long time. So there are two ways to deal with that. One is to have a very long focal length and crop in just on this less exposed area. And the other is to don't do it for very long or keep, keep your filter on and you'll end up with something that looks more like that. So that's without the flaring, but your camera's safe. If you're photographing that, your sensor is in danger. Um, but in a total eclipse, the area that's going to show the beating is much smaller. Therefore, the 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 risk to the um to the sensor I think is 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 much lower, but twenty to thirty seconds beforehand um, should be fine. Okay, so Patricia's asking. I think Patricia, you're asking about um, April twenty twenty four. So let me um, let me explain what happens here. The as I'm as I'm many of you know, and, and thank you to those of you who are um, pro subscribers to, to to the plan. There are a few differences in what you can get through the free version of the site versus the paid version of the site. Let me just clarify what those are. Um, firstly, if you're anybody can look at any historical solar eclipse um, for free with the lunar limb, all good. It's all, all there. Anybody can look at the central path and the contact times for any future past or future eclipse that's included. To see the, these lines of partial eclipse, um, so this pink is the central path. Um, once you're outside the pink zone, you're into a partial eclipse. So that line there is where it's about magnitude 0.8. Um, this line here is where it's 0.6, more or less, 0.6. Those lines, the partial lines you get if you are a pro subscriber. Um, the simulator is free for the April 8th, uh, 2024 eclipse, but without the Bailey's beads and without the lunar limb. So if you are on the free plan and you're looking at April 8th, let me go back somewhere interesting. Um, you won't see the lunar limb in, in outline mode. It'll just look, it'll just look smooth. 
So the contact times are fine. The simulation is 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 in in this photorealistic mode is good. Uh, you just don't get those those limb limb corrected effects. Um, pro subscribers will get the limb corrections for and the limb profiles for any 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 clips past, present, or or future. Uh, so if you find this is useful and and you're you know looking to support the site or or do some of this advanced planning, then then please do consider subscribing. We'd very much appreciate having you as a as a pro user. Uh, let me check a few more questions. Okay, Tom asks an excellent question. Tom is asking. Let's go back to the map. Maps showing eclipse paths all have a discrete start and end. What happens at each of those ends? That's an excellent question, Tom. And I, I've spent rather a lot of time this year looking at eclipse stuff, and it took me an age to get my head around it. Now I'm not currently showing these things um it's probably something we'll add in the future but out here what what is going on at the ends of the eclipse path let me, let me talk about that quickly so if i just drop the pin somewhere here what you will see at the ends of the path um tends to be when the uh the sun is close to rise or set so the ends of the path are basically where the um the sun's either has not yet risen or has set. And you can see here in the simulator, when I zoom out uh, and I go to max eclipse, the sun is only 0 0.72 degrees above the horizon. And the horizon line is shown here uh, in the in the simulator. So that's, uh, that's essentially what is going on. If I take this and drop the pin there, oops, no eclipse. And you see that all of these contact times happen before sunrise. Um, in this case, if we go to the other end of the path, it would be the other way around. It would be after after sunset. There are a few wacky eclipses where both ends of, of the path happen at either sunrise or sunset, which is all, all a bit strange. If you go up to these other limit lines, so if you're south of this line here, there is no eclipse at all. So that's outside the zone of any eclipse. If I move the, the pin just inside it, you get a max eclipse. But you see that is the max eclipse, and that's it. That's all you get. Uh, it's magnitude of 0.2786. Um, so those, that's what those the, the happens at the end, ends of the line. Okay, so now I'm going to flip back to my presentation. And I, we had a few questions on solar filters. So I showed this, this slide last time. Um, what sort of solar filter should, should you get? So I would say that for the total eclipse next April, uh, a solar filter is required if you want to photograph the partial phases of the eclipse. The solar filter must be removed to photograph totality. If you don't have, um, if you have a solar filter on during totality, you'll miss it all. So it's going to come off um, during that period. However, if you want solar filter, there are lots of different ones available. Uh, they give slightly different appearance out of the out of the out of the box. Um, this this one is star guides like a aluminium i think film barter film it's called it's used a lot by astronomers it gives a slightly blue cast to the image this is the nisi solar filter it's like a, a, a specialized nd filter with extra uv and I, ir filtering that gives this white appearance and then a polymer sheet from thousand oaks uh, that gives this orange appearance. That's a, essentially an artificial color, but it's quite a um, it's quite an attractive color, and you'll see a lot of folks put up clip sequences with with that in in um, in, in use, and it, it looks nice. So you can take your pick. Um, that's like a hundred and sixty dollar filter for the the size I had to get. That was literally a twelve dollar sheet that we stuck on the lens with with an elastic band. So. You can uh, take take your pick on your your budget and aesthetic preferences on those, and um, you can buy these at uh, any of the regular um, online places in in the US. That would be you know BH uh, BNH uh, in New York, BH Photo Video .com or whatever they are. Adorama. Uh, you can go straight to the manufacturers. Uh, Thousand Oaks has got a website, although I noticed it was down this morning. Um, I think Nisi Cell Directors as well, or no? Yeah, I guess it's Nisi. I don't know. Uh, they they sell direct from their, their website also. Um, a few more 
resources here. So here's the link to the solar system eclipse safety page that NASA have. That will tell you where you can buy um, uh, eclipse, eclipse glasses uh, if you don't have any. Again, only going to be needed for the partial phase. You'll take them off during totality. A few fantastic photo tips here. So if you're looking for more details on exposures and shutter speeds, you can get guidance here. But but be careful, particularly when you're shooting through. And if anybody says the, the exposure for when a solar filter on, is on is X, it's not necessarily true. The um, the exposure times that we used for these filters, you can see in these shots, they're, they're all different. So the exposure time you're going to need is going to depend on the exact filter you have. So you've got to be careful with that. And you should do, do your own testing. Um, that said, for totality, I think the, um, the exposure times are relatively predictable, um, or the exposure settings. Uh, but again, it's going to vary based on your equipment and your lens. Some lenses are sharpest at slightly different apertures, although f8 is commonly the, the best aperture on many lenses. But check for your own equipment, um, see what's going to be best. Otherwise, you can have a look uh, here. Um, grab a screen screenshot of this if you, if, if you haven't, or we'll, I'll send it out in the video link as well. This was the weather site that we looked at, Eclipse file. Um, there's a page, of course, for the 2024 Eclipse as well. If you're really interested in maps, another great site is greatamericaneclipse.com. And uh, Michael Zala, who runs that, processes um, gazillion data points for eclipses into creating other, other maps that uh, they're more static. So they're not, you don't interact with them in the same way you do in photo ephemeris. Uh, but he can show you different data, such as travel times to the, the path of totality and so forth. And then we have the links that I showed you earlier. Probably the easiest way to find these, again, is um, come to the web app, maximize that, hit help, and they're going to pop up right there. So you can get to all of those, um, those articles there. If I click that one, it, it, it pops up in situ, which doesn't look great, but you can Click that button there, and it it opens up um, with all of the all of the detail. I think that's probably everything uh, to cover today. I could I could keep going on in more detail um, on some of these details of the simulator, but I think the the best way forward is to um, is to explore it yourselves. The one thing I didn't I didn't talk about this. It's a pretty advanced topic. If you are a super serious eclipse chaser, um, you might want to care about the solar radius. So the solar radius is, um, it's its really more to do with, it affects the, the beading. So it's, it's to do with what is the actual size of the sun in the sky. If the sun is bigger, the eclipses are shorter because the moon's fixed size. But if the sun is slightly larger, then it disappears later and reappears sooner. So you can, um, there's some debate in, in eclipse chasing circles around what's the right value. The current best value for the purposes of eclipse observation is this 959.95 arc seconds. And so that's what it defaults to. The traditional value is this one from 1891. But you'll see, let's just have a look at what it does to the beads. I mean, I'll put this onto, onto max. Just look in there. Um, there's the old value. Here is the, the new value, more beads. Slightly shorter totality, more beads. This is the largest value that's been, been reported. But these are, as you see, they're pretty subtle differences. This value, the, the International Astronomical, Astronomical Union's value of 59.22, that's it's there just because that is the official value from the IAU, but it's not really reflective of what you see in, in many eclipses. So on, on the Bailey's beads patterns on this page, it, uh, they're all done with that 959.95 value, apart from a couple, um, which use a larger, a larger number. Where has it gone? Uh, further down. Yeah, this one here, for example. This is the very latest data from April's eclipse. Uh, which uses this 960.01 value. 
that's what they observed and i've overlaid the simulator on top when, with that set so if you're super interested in this there's so much to get into it's, it's a fascinating area um I, one can become a little obsessed as as you probably heard on these things there is um just so you know uh, if you want to really get into it there is a mailing list um it's at the bottom of this page consider joining the solar eclipse mailing list and really the world's eclipse experts hang out there so you can read there's a ton in the archives it's fascinating you have to sign up um just to, to join the list it's not a place for beginner questions for sure um and you want to do your research before you go post there because there's a lot of information that's already there but it's an interesting resource so uh yeah uh if you have your own photographs of Bailey's beads and you you can do a comparison, we'd love love to see it. We'd love to see what your experiences are with this. This is brand new; it came out this week, so um, we we would welcome your feedback on it, also on the usability and any other functionality that that you would like to see. And um, with that, I think to, to to summarize, I would say, you know, think about. Um, Think about what your photographic goals are. If you want to photograph a sequence from C1 to C4, then you're going to be checking more the geometry of the situation, and you're going to be seeing that the, the you know the sun is the sun is starting at certain azimuth and altitude, and uh, you're going to be seeing that at the end it's it's moved all the way over there. So what's the field of view that I need? There is, um, in case you haven't seen it. It's a, bit, it's a bit buried. Where has it gone? I'll show you this. Uh, I'm going to get this integrated into the web app at some point. But there is a free field of view tool that you can use to check these things. Uh, you go to the website, photoephemeris.com, um, tools, FOV. The link is at the bottom of every page on the, on the website. And you can use that to check your field of view um, on your lens and compare that with So what you're looking for is the azimuth and altitude coverage so if back here you see that first contact has the sun at 119 azimuth and fourth contact has it at 214 then you can see what field of view you would need to get an equivalent equivalent uh coverage to to uh capture the the eclipse without moving the camera that's another resource that is that's free uh, on on the site. So that's uh, yeah for for full sequence shots. Think about that. If you're shooting with telephoto to get the details, then jump into this simulator. Focus your times around. Focus your your studies around C two, C three. Check the profiles. Check some different locations. It's all going to be different, and it's going to be fascinating to see what uh, what people capture next April probably the most photographed eclipse of uh, all time, I imagine. Um, so it'll be great to see what you come up with. Uh, I think we're good on questions. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.